Okay, let's talk about libertarianism. I apologize in advance. I'm probably going to sneeze uh, during this, <coughs> as I'm being laid low by some kind of some kind of allergies. Um, I, I find myself in the allergy disadvantaged part of the distribution curve and demand extra primary goods to make up for it. But uh, it was either sneeze or be completely incoherent on uh, Dayquil or something. So let's talk about libertarianism and not so much about my sneezing. So the first thing, <clears throat> just to put libertarianism in the sense we're going to talk about it in context. Libertarianism is, like liberalism, one of these words that gets used in a lot of different ways by different people. The um, broadest sense is a sort of freedom-respecting kind of view, and in that way a lot of anarchists, especially European anarchists, will call themselves libertarians and get really annoyed at the American use of the word. Kimlicka is using it more in a way to designate kind of the way we use it in the U.S., but even in a slightly more restricted fashion. <clears throat> so in the United States context, in a lot of Western contexts, if you call yourself a libertarian, typically what you mean is that you favor a small government limited primarily to the provision of policing services, enforcement of contracts, and national defense. This is what Robert Nozick calls a minimal state, and that most of the rest of the things in society should be provided through the market, or sometimes through um, non-market voluntary associations, but typically through, through markets. The thing is, there are three possible ways, at least, that you could come to believe this, only one of which is the kind that Kimlicka is talking about, so it'll... I think it will help understand what he's on about if you're not worrying, if you're not wonder, sitting there wondering, well, where, wait, hold on, I don't believe in any of this stuff, but I'm a libertarian. So three possible ways you could get there. The first is you could be a utilitarian and believe that free markets just work the best for everyone. Lots of economists basically fall into this kind of category. Now, if you, if you are a utilitarian, who happens to believe that free markets work the best and limited government works the best in terms of overall outcomes. What distinguishes you from the kind of person that Kimlick is talking about is, for instance, if it turns out, if you were, became convinced that social democratic systems that reduce inequality actually lead to better outcomes for everyone, you know, who knows why? Maybe it increases productivity to have uh, smaller economic divides. If you're a utilitarian, that should convince you that, well, maybe I should not be a total small government libertarian. Maybe we should go more in this direction because that leads to the better outcomes, right? You, you may not be convinced of that, but what distinguishes you from the Kimlicka style libertarian is that if you did become convinced of it, you would say, yeah, great, let's do that. Um, whereas Kimlicka style utilitarians would say, no, I don't, I don't care if it turns out to be better for everyone in some kind of utility maximizing sense. It violates lots of people's freedom to do things that way. Okay. Second, you might be uh, what I've been calling a right-wing liberal egalitarian. You might essentially believe all of the high-level things that liberal egalitarians believe. That the social contract should be acceptable to everyone. Um, that fairness requires <clears throat> helping the least well off, um, you know, that you want to reduce inequality uh, to a large extent. You might believe all of that, but believe that the specific kinds of policies that liberal egalitarians in the real world tend to support, things like redistribution of wealth, welfare state policies, universal health care, all that sort of stuff, doesn't actually get us there, right? That it creates traps of dependency. It actually helps keep poor people down. Um, and the better way to reduce inequality is to get the government out of the way, free up the markets, let people compete, you know, and that's the way that a poor person born in the inner city is going to become wealthy, um, not by giving them a handout, right? Again, sort of like the utilitarian, what distinguishes you from the sort of true or proper libertarian in Kimlicka's sense is that should you become convinced that no, actually welfare helps people out. 
that presumably you would change your you would change your view if you if what you really care about is the same kind of things that the liberal egalitarians care about, but you disagree with typical liberal egalitarian policy. So the last one, and what Kimlick is talking about is libertarianism proper, um, which is the idea that the reason why you want to have limited government and the reason why you want to have the market take care of pretty much everything that you can take care of with it is that only markets and other kinds of voluntary associations fully respect people's rights and their freedom. So it doesn't matter, it, it might be, you know, you typically people who believe this also believe that markets work pretty well, right? Also believe that this is not just a way of completely screwing over the poor. But what's fundamental about it is that even if it turned out that you could have a non-market system that was more efficient, no, only the markets fully respect human freedom. Even if it turns out that some people are going to end up poor and poorer than they sort of need to be given our resources in the system, it doesn't matter because to redress that would violate people's freedom. And violating people's freedom is more important, or not violating people's freedom rather, is more important than ensuring that nobody is poor. One last note before we move off of this. I am talking about libertarianism, not sort of, you know, in the U.S. it's identified as a conservative position. And what we haven't talked about, and what you may be wondering when we're going to get to, is, pardon me. Oh. What do we do? Where are we going to get to the people who are not sort of libertarian conservatives, but are, I guess, non-libertarian conservatives, sometimes in the U.S. context called social conservatives? Um, what if you believe that the government ought to be in the business of defending traditional values or of making people into good people, this sort of thing? We're going to get to you. You are probably a communitarian, which is something that we'll talk about in a couple weeks. So sit tight. <coughs> All right. Key ideas of libertarianism. First is libertarianism is a liberal theory in the sense that we were talking about in the last lecture, small l liberal. It's individualist, it focuses on rights, it typically, uh, libertarians typically make some kind of social contract central to their theory, um, and the social contract is often taken to legitimize uh, the limited amount of government there is. One thing that libertarians often make a big deal about is that they want, when, they're, when we're talking about resource distribution, libertarians think that we need to have a procedural instead of a patterned ideal for what counts as distributive justice or fairness in the distribution of resources. So remember for Rawls, a big part of what he took to justify a government because this is what would make it acceptable to the least well off is that <clears throat> the system should be set up in such a way that it makes the least well off as well off as they can be. Right? And any inequalities in the system are there because having those inequalities makes the least well off better off than they, they would be in a more equal system. Right? It incentivizes people to become doctors or potato farmers or whatever you need, basically is the idea. But libertarians typically object to any kind of claim that what we ought to be aiming for is some particular kind of distribution, right? One where the people who are least well off are as well off as they can be, or one, you know, where the distribution is as most, you know, leads to the most utility that it can. They want to say that what we should be focusing on are the rules for transferring goods in society, not what the outcomes are. So. Like other liberals, they take personal freedom to be a central value. And for libertarians, often it is a kind of overriding value. I say that with some caution because other liberals would probably resist the idea that they care less about freedom than libertarians, but it plays a particularly central role in libertarian theory. So when it comes to distribution patterns, what libertarians say essentially is, look, however, whatever kind of pattern of distribution you have, it doesn't come about by magic. Either 
it comes about through some kind of fair rules. But if we don't have, if we're not willing to just accept that whatever the outcome of the fair rules is, is what we should is what we should stay with, then getting from whatever outcome comes out because of your rules to whatever outcome you like because of the shape of the distribution requires taking stuff away from people who got it through the fair rules. So that sounds pretty abstract, but the basic idea is the basic idea is this, right? If people are poor in society and I'm fairly wealthy, the only way you can make the poor people less less poor is to take some of my stuff away and give it to them. Now this might make sense if I stole the stuff from them or I defrauded them of it. But most people, say libertarians, Occupy Wall Street may disagree, most people who are wealthy in our kinds of societies are not wealthy because they stole stuff from anyone. They're just wealthy because they played the market game better. Or maybe they inherited it, right? But even if I inherited it, maybe I don't deserve it in some deep moral sense. I don't deserve the money that, you know, well, my parents are still alive, so they haven't really left me any money. But they, I don't deserve the money my parents have gifted me over the years. But at the same time, you know, I didn't steal it from anyone. It's not my fault if I have it and nobody else does. So, ultimately, what this leads libertarians to say is that we shouldn't worry about the shape of the distribution. The distribution of goods in the society is just and right and moral and legitimate as long as the way we got it was through a process of just acquisition and voluntary exchange. So that's to say, the way that we got to however people, however much stuff people have in society is that for any piece of stuff you have, its history is one in which either you got it from somebody who freely exchanged it with you, not under duress, not coercion, not defrauded, or you took something that was unowned and acquired it in a, in a reasonable manner. Um, now, what you need to do in order to acquire the unowned, you know, acquire natural resources owned by no one from the environment, is actually kind of finicky, and it's in. It may not seem to have such a deep um, implication, but it is actually one of the main things that's issue between st standard issue libertarians and the folks who concern themselves left libertarians, uh, like Peter Valentine. We can talk about that in class. I'm not going to get into it here because it's a bit of a digression. Okay, but the bottom line is, doesn't matter how things are distributed. Doesn't matter if everybody is the same or if Bill Gates has everything and nobody has anything else. As long as we got here through a process where all the resources in society moved around either by being acquired fairly from the, from the unknown state and the environment or being traded freely between people, it's just, and nobody has any reason to complain about it. So, on a deeper level, um, when libertarians talk about justice, how to fill out these rules, Typically, um, this is really based on Nozick, but it's fairly typical of libertarian theory. This is the principles. These are the principles they think that um, just distributions ought to be governed by. These are the rules of the game. As long as these are observed, then the distribution is fair. First is absolute self ownership. Nozick, in particular, takes this as sort of the axiom of his entire system that I own myself. I have absolute right over my physical body, over what my what I do with my physical body, and that sort of thing. No one can tell me that I must use my physical body in any particular way unless I agree with them to do it. Nozick thinks this is the first principle. Um, he picks it up from Locke. Interestingly, Locke thinks that um, we own our bodies because God created us and creators own their creations. So basically, uh, on Locke's theory, God creates human beings and then gives our bodies to us in a matter of free exchange. Uh, Nozick just takes the bodily ownership, he cuts God out of the loop and takes it to be uh, sort of a bedrock given. Um, and basically what Nozick says is, 
if you don't agree that you should have control over your own body, then you know I I don't I can't I can't argue you out of that right. You need you need help. You don't need a philosopher. Is basically Nozick's position. Um, okay. From absolute self ownership follows uh, that anything I create with resources I own or that I create with resources that nobody owns. Um, the Lockean uh, phraseology is that you mix your labor with the world becomes mine. So if I come across some apples that nobody owns, I pick them and um, then they're mine. I didn't do a lot of labor, but I did a little labor by picking them. If I come across um, unowned land, if I just walk across the land, right, it, it doesn't make it mine. Both Locke and Nozick would reject sort of the the um, the kind of caricature colonial practice of you know you plant a flag and then all the land you can see is yours. Both of them would say, well, no, you have to you have to acquire it somehow. Um, Locke is more rigorous about this, but you know you have to work the land. But if you improve it, right? If you turn unowned forest into farmland, then it becomes yours, as long as you know. Yeah, it has to be unowned, is the, the basic purpose of it. This is where Locke gets into some issues about Native Americans. But um, let's bracket that. Okay. So, of course, we don't get everything by taking unowned natural resources and making them our own. Most of the stuff that probably most of us listening to this, we got through voluntary transfer. We made agreements with people to get the stuff. I make an agreement with the University of Maryland that I will come and teach a class. And they agree, yeah, okay, if you do that, we'll give you some money. Then I take that money, I go to the store, I say, shop owner, I would like to purchase your delicious food. And he says, wonderful, my good sir, give me some of that money you have, and I will trade this food to you for it. And, you know, that's how the rest of everything works that we don't originally uh, acquire. And again, um, the question of how it's just to originally acquire things is a little bit, is a little bit vexed. Um, Locke and Nozick and most other contemporary utilitarian, contemporary libertarians rather have this kind of unilateral appropriation model. The problem is, so the real question is, um, pardon me. The real question is, all of the stuff in the world that humans didn't create, did it start out owned by everyone or owned by nobody? Locke, Nozick following him, most contemporary libertarians take the, theory, take the theory that essentially the world started out unowned. Since it's not owned, you can unilaterally acquire it. If you fence the land off and farm it, it becomes yours. You don't have to check with anyone else. And the reason is that, you know, part of the reason for this is that they, they, they rightly think if it was owned by everyone, you would have this problem of no one ever being able to acquire anything, right? You basically have to, you know, the same way that if you want to buy my house, which is owned by me and my wife, you have to make an agreement with both of us. If unowned, if things in the state of nature, if things in the natural world were owned by everyone originally, you would have had to make an agreement with everyone in order to be able to get anything. No one would ever own anything. We'd never improve the land, yada, yada, yada. We'd all be living in, you know, in the forests still. Some people think that's not so bad. Locke and Nozick, very much against living as hunter-gatherers. Um, so the left libertarians are largely defined by saying, having some version of the view that things are owned in common uh, before they are acquired. And from this, they think, flows not that you need to vote with everyone on it, but typically that you owe some kind of compensation for taking it out, and they justify a lot of redistribution on that on that kind of basis. Again, we can get into that more if you guys are interested. One last thing to know about libertarian justice is that while on the while for someone like a utilitarian, most utilitarians believe that this is not just a good political morality, it is a good morality period, right? You ought to be utilitarian in your personal life and you ought to be utilitarian in your way of thinking about what is legitimate to do from a policy standpoint. 
most libertarians, possibly except it, possibly with the exception of the Ayn Rand types, and I am not a Rand expert, so if you are, enlighten me. Most libertarians, though, do not take libertarianism to be exhaustive of morality. So, for instance, for a lot of libertarians, one of the advantages they think of drastically reducing the size of government would be an expansion of private charity. So a libertarian doesn't necessarily have to believe that nobody, that it wouldn't be good for you to help out people who are less well off than you are. They don't even have to believe that people aren't morally obligated to do so. They might believe that people are, are morally obligated to help out people who are less fortunate. What they don't think is that fairness and justice demand it. Charity might demand it. Compassion might demand it. But because fairness and justice don't demand it, it cannot be enforced by a government with coercive power. It would be illegitimate for the government to make you give charity, to make you be compassionate. So libertarianism does not necessarily have to mean that you think that you should not give away a lot of your money or help people who are less fortunate. It just means the government should be making you do it. All right. One question that libertarians have to answer, basically, is why not just be anarcho-capitalists? If it's so important to respect individual freedom, um, if no kind of hypothetical contract can take it away from me, if I don't have to worry about, well, what I have agreed to this if I was the poor person, because the libertarian says, well, you're not the poor person, right? You're the person with the stuff. It doesn't matter what the poor person, what you would have agreed to if you were a poor person. What matters is what you and the poor person actually agreed to. And, you know, that's typically not going to be that you give up your stuff, right? As long as you didn't defraud them or take it from them, you know. So if you have that kind of focus on personal freedom at the center of your theory, why not just be an anarchist of some sort? Why is it that the government cannot tax me legitimately to pay for welfare or to pay for universal health care or to pay for foreign aid, but it can legitimately tax me to pay for the military and for the police? Um, you know, why not have an option where I just buy private security if I want it? And if I can't afford it, you know, oh well. The same way that, that if somebody can't afford a television, we say, oh well. Or if they can't afford health care, we say, oh well. You know, that's unfortunate, but it doesn't justify forcing someone else to give up their stuff to do it. <clears throat> and part of what puts the pressure on the libertarians is that typically they do believe that rights exist outside of the government. Rights are not created by the government. You have natural rights uh, in the state of nature. So why not just say, no government, everybody respect, everybody morally ought to respect everybody else's rights. Um, and if you're worried about it, you know, voluntarily agree to get together uh, to protect yourself. Well, this is the root of the problem. Rights exist outside of government, but they're not reliably respected outside of government, um, most libertarians would say. There's no one to enforce them, so uh, there's no one to stop people from violating your rights. Governments for libertarians are basically firms, basically companies or corporations that are specialized in rights enforcement, or that's at least what they should be, right? Actual governments, uh, libertarians, most libertarians look at it as sort of like U.S. car companies, right? U.S. car companies have started out making cars, but now they've got like giant insurance arms and this sort of thing. That's what real governments look like to, to libertarians, right? They, their core business ought to be protecting your rights. But, you know, they've taken on all this other crap over the years, right? Now they, they produce public television and sell health care and insurance and all sorts of stuff. Um, now, the question that libertarians have to answer is, if governments are basically just like companies that provide security, why not just let it be voluntary? Um, you know... Why not just let me hire Black... Well, Blackwater doesn't run around anymore, right? But hire, um, you know, hire a security firm to protect my house if I'm worried about people taking my stuff. The answer is a little bit complicated. Um, 
The problem is you can't just say, if you're a libertarian of this stripe, you can't just say, well, um, people's rights will be violated a lot if we don't get together and pay for collective security, right? So let's say I'm wealthy enough to pay for a guard at my house, but you're not, right? If you want to explain why it is that someone should be able to come and take some of my money to pay for a guard at your house, it's a little bit complicated. You can't just say, well, because isn't it awful that his, his rights are violated? Because then I'll say, well, yeah, it's awful, but it's not my fault. I'm not violating her rights. I'm not going over and taking her stuff. Why should I have to pay for her guard? I'm not making people go do it. Different libertarians have different kinds of answers. Some just say, well, there's something special about rights violations. Um, Nozick has a pretty complicated story that a lot of people like. Um, and again, I can get into this in great detail if you if you want, trying to walk through it. But the bottom line for Nozick is that in order for rights protection to work, we have to outlaw self-help, right? We have to say, <clears throat> you're not allowed to. You're not allowed to say, I don't want to pay for police. I want to just protect my house with my own shotgun. It causes all sorts of problems. It causes more rights violations to do that. So, the protective associations that are sort of proto-governments for Nozick have to stop people from defending their own rights. And as a result, the only way to make it okay, the only way to compensate for that rights violation is to have everybody else who can afford it pay into a pot to pay for protection for the people who you're stopping from protecting themselves. But bottom line is, libertarians do have to deal with this question of, why are we not anarchists? And if they say, we're not anarchists because things work out better this way, that's basically giving up the game on utilitarianism, right? Then you're a utilitarian of some sort or a consequentialist of some sort. You're not focusing on freedom in the, in the way that core libertarians do anymore. All right. A different side of, of this, this has been a lot of theoretical stuff, but a different side of this that's very strong strand in libertarian thought, libertarians talk about political freedom is really the core value, the freedom to live your own life. And yet at the same time, most libertarians end up supporting markets. And you might reasonably ask, what's the connection between me living a sort of free and unencumbered uh, individualist life and Paris Hilton being able to buy all sorts of tchotchkes, right? What could possibly be the connection between the sort of highly valuable freedom that libertarians are focused on and people's ability to to spend money on consumer goods, right? Might, quite plausibly, you might say, well, yeah, I like this freedom thing, but I don't understand why we're saying, yeah, you know what, if you want to spend your money on potato chips and Xbox instead of giving it to the poor, that's fine. What's the connection? All right. First is, notice... It's worth noting, this is not a, the, the idea that there's a connection between economic freedom and personal or political freedom is actually not something specific to libertarians. Liberal egalitarians agree on this. In fact, Marxists agree on this. This is the connection between economic freedom and political freedom is actually, in a lot of ways, the core of what made Marx a Marxist. So lots of people agree that there is a connection. And the basic connection is that you need resources to exercise your freedoms. <clears throat> We've talked about this a little bit, but if you just say, I will not stop you from doing what you want, this is often useless to me. If you say, I won't stop you from eating, but I don't have any food, I starve anyway. If you say, I won't stop you from speaking your mind, but I can't afford to access any venue for getting my ideas across, it doesn't matter that much. Um, even if you want to say, you know, I won't stop you from playing Xbox all day. If I can't buy an Xbox, that's not very helpful to me. So you need some kind of resources to exercise your freedoms. In addition to this kind of instrumental thing, um, and this is something that M Marxists love, you know, bizarrely, where they are really lockstep with the libertarians, is that working and creating, not so much for the Marxists consuming, but for the libertarians consuming, giving stuff away, these are important spheres of freedom, right? 
I can make it sound pretty trivial if I talk about, you know, Paris Hilton buying clothes for her dog. But when we talk about having the kinds of resources that a farmer needs to grow food, uh, you know, or a artist needs to paint or sculpt, right? Resources for creative activity, physical resources you need for creative activity, or even certain kinds of consumption. Uh, Adam Smith famously talked about the need for a linen shirt, right? Nobody needs a linen shirt. This was 19, no, not even 19th century, 18th century, right? Nobody needs a linen shirt in the sense of like they will freeze without it. But what Smith pointed out is people might need a linen shirt to be able to go about in a socially respectable manner, right? So I don't need ties, right? Ties are almost by definition an absolutely useless article of clothing, yet I own ties. Why do I own ties? Because there are certain kinds of venues where if I showed up without a tie, I would not be respectable. Uh, David Crocker, who's one of the professors here, has talked also about the way that consumption can sort of brand you as part of a social group, right? Um, if I wear punk rock t-shirts around, it helps me be part of that group of people who, you know, wear punk rock t-shirts. Similarly, if you, you know, whatever, whatever you're into, right? You wear your Orioles baseball cap. So consumption, creation, all these things we do with our stuff are actually important parts of our freedom, right? If you imagine what kind of life you could have if you were free to do anything that didn't require physical stuff, it be, wouldn't be a whole lot left. Now, the other part of this, right? So there's one part that this is the view that economic freedom is actually an important sphere of freedom, even if it might seem trivial, right? And part of the bottom line is that if you try to say, well, there's a, here's the rule. You're allowed to buy art supplies, but you're not allowed to buy frivolous outfits for your dog. You get back into this kind of question about, well, where, who draws the line and how do you draw it and where's the line? Okay. That's sort of a constitutive element. There's an instrumental side of this argument too, which is that economic freedom requires a lot of the same things that make for political freedom. This is especially strong in arguments for why markets are linked to democracy. You can't have a functioning market if you don't allow freedom of association, if you don't allow freedom of expression, right? If people aren't allowed to say what they believe and what they want and what they think might be the next big thing that you should be building with your corporation, if people aren't allowed to get together into corporations, you can't have a functioning market. But all of those other things are basically the same political freedoms that you need um, to be free in the more obviously valorized sense of political freedom, right? Um, you, it's really hard to have a system where you allow people to get together freely to discuss business, but you don't allow them to get together freely to discuss politics or religion or the good or whatever. I mean, as always, or not about as always, but as very common with these kind of arguments, China is the big sort of question mark here. And this is what a lot of people think will eventually lead to political liberalization in China, is that they can't let their market run and be really good unless they give people a lot of other freedoms that will eventually lead to broader political freedom. People have been predicting this will happen for China for a while now, so we'll have to see how it works out, but that's the idea. And finally, there's an instrumental reason um, for this. Uh, a lot of libertarians will say, well, sure, there's a sense in which the freedom of Mattel to make toys might not be quite as central to our notion of the good human life as the freedom that you have to like raise a family or to express your political views. But allowing for a free market is a bulwark against government tyranny because it provides an alternative power source to the government. If the government got to control what happened economically and politically, if it unified political and coercive power, it would inevitably become too powerful. And so you want to have a system where there's a strong, strong other pole of political power from the government. 
All right. Now, of course, there are plenty of people who've thought that economic freedom, in fact, limits personal freedom. It's dangerous for, for sort of political and personal freedom to allow too much economic freedom in your system. The first is that money and resources are power. This goes back to actually the flip side of the same argument that you need material goods to exercise your freedoms. Um, as Kim Luka points out, right, if you say that, well, no one is allowed to enslave you with a gun, right? No one's allowed to put a gun to your head and say, you must do everything I say. But if someone is allowed to own so many resources, especially resources that you might need to live, right? They own the food. Well, they can coerce you just as well as if they put a gun to your head. If I say, do what I say, or, you know, you can't eat any of the food grown on this land that I own, you're going to listen to me, even if I don't actually, actually literally have a gun to your head. So economic domination, the argument goes, can create quote-unquote voluntary relationships, but that are just as dominating as ones that flow from the barrel of a gun, right? The argument would be, if I put a gun to your head, I might make you say, yeah, I agree to do this, but that doesn't make it voluntary. And the argument from critics would be that if I, you know, put the threat of starvation or homelessness or other kind of radical economic disadvantage at, you know, point that kind of threat at you, even if you agree, you make the words, it's operating under duress. It's still a sort of slavery-like or coercion-like arrangement. Um, if we And large economic equalities can allow for those things to happen. Um, more on the political side, money can buy power. Democracy is a kind of redistribution of political power, a very egalitarian, and on the ideal, at least, redistribution of political power. So if you are a defender of democracy, you might worry about allowing unfettered markets for all of the good Citizens United reasons that people talk about now. That it's one thing to say everybody gets one vote, that makes everyone equal, but if there are large concentrations of wealth where people can spend a huge amount of money on political ads, this might distort democracy. And again, like with the slavery or, or sort of coercive arrangement sort of critique, the idea is that if you allow a completely unfettered market, we know that unfettered markets will lead to, or at least the argument is that unfettered markets will lead to large inequities, large differentials in economic power that can then be translated into large differentials in political power. And finally, some critics will say that there's a fundamental disconnect between the values of the market and the values of a political community. This is a preview of what communitarians and civic republicans basically are worried about. Political freedom, a good political community, requires everyone to work together. It requires everyone to restrain their own self-interest to work for the common good. Whereas markets encourage competition and dominance. They encourage people to not work together, to get one over on the other guy, to, um, you know, get it to try to acquire as much as they can. Now, even if you believe that the invisible hand of the market makes this all work out economically, the argument is that these values are not the values we need people to have politically. And if you have a society that's very focused on markets, that you will not create citizens who participate properly in the political system. All right, so why should policymakers be libertarians? It respects freedom. There's, there's sort of the, the clearest argument for this. Um, there's a lot packed into that, but liber many libertarians would almost want, I think, would almost want to say that there's nothing else that you should have to say. Freedom is a crucial value. Libertarianism respects freedom. If you say, oh, yeah, but what about, you know, interstate highways or economic efficiency or whatever? No. You are selling your birthright for a mess of pottage. Freedom is more important than any of those other things. But, to be fair, many libertarians will also add, oh, and we think it's probably the most economically efficient. There's some argument about that, but that is a very common support given for libertarians, libertarianism as a sort of governmental policy. Okay, so why shouldn't they be libertarians? 
Well, as I said, one argument is that libertarianism ensures negative freedom. Um, it ensures freedom from restriction, freedom from people telling you, no, you can't do that. But um, it that may be not worth very much. That may not be very valuable without positive freedom, without the resources that you need to actually exercise those freedoms. This is Kimlick's big critique, basically, is that a libertarian system fetishizes um, a lack of people with guns telling you no and ends up with a system where most people can't actually do what they want to do. More people can't actually do what they want to do to a greater extent than if you occasionally told people with no with guns or told them that they had to give up some of their stuff and spread it around more evenly. Part of this is that libertarians, at least the, the political expression of libertarianism, may focus too much on the power of the government and miss the ways in which non-governmental entities can dominate people or exercise coercive or quasi-coercive power. There's actually been a recent discussion of bleeding heart libertarianism that tries to apply principles to things like corporations um, that can also wield a lot of power. But core libertarianism, one, one critique is that it limits governmental power and domination, but the government is only one agent that can dominate you or exercise power. And the last one that's, I, I think, pretty problematic for libertarians, there have been libertarians that have tried to address this, but it's a slightly difficult question, is what do we do from a policy standpoint about the fact that the stuff we have, the distribution we have now, is not actually the result of a libertarianly respectable process of just acquisition and um, voluntary transfer, right? I am sitting, if you're in my class, if you're not just randomly listening to this on the internet, um, we're all sitting here in the United States. You may notice that the land here was taken by conquest, basically. Um, we had a long history of slavery, right? Slavery is now done. Um, you did not buy any of your stuff directly from someone who created it under slave labor conditions, but lots of the stuff around, right? If you trace your stuff backwards, you say, well, where did I get my bike? I got it from the store. Well, I got it on a, put, took it on a road, right? Where'd the road come from? If you trace a lot of that stuff back here in the United States, eventually you hit, oh crap, some slave built this, right? Slavery is not cool on a libertarian um, approach. Conquest is not acceptable. Genocide is not acceptable as ways to get stuff. So there's a big question about what do we do about the fact that the actual stuff that actual people have right now is sort of infected with force and fraud in a way that is not respectable for libertarians. There are a couple options, but all of them have problems. Um, one option is that we do a sort of one-time wipe the slate clean, right? It's probably impossible for us to trace the origin of all of our stuff back in enough detail that we could set everything right. Um, but one option is we do a sort of one-time wipe the slate clean, or we do a kind of one-time reparation, right? Some kind of compensation um, to reset the balance for force and fraud. We basically say, look, all right, we know that that... You know, the most radical version of this would be say, we know that um, lots of our stuff came from force and fraud, so just this once, we're going to put it all in a big pot, divvy it up, and, uh, you know, everyone gets equal, and then we, we go from there, and, you know, we don't use force and fraud anymore. A less radical version would be some kind of compensation or reparations. It's basically the left libertarians there. Um, that's, in some ways, attractive as a solution, but, of course, it's really hard to implement. Um, it's probably not going to happen. Um, and it's pretty radical. Um, it's in some ways, you know, you start out with libertarians defending the way that things actually are and end up with this extremely radical kind of uh, way of, of dealing with it. Other libertarians um, think that, well, we shouldn't do anything about it, either because, uh, you know, individual actual living people typically did not acquire their stuff through force or fraud, or they think that, well, it kind of comes out in the wash over a few generations. So, yeah, there was, um, you know, genocide of Native Americans a 
few hundred years ago, but by now, you know, the place that Native Americans are in the U.S. is basically a result of voluntary exchange and acquisition. Um, the, the historical injustice has largely been washed out by later stuff. I will admit, I find that view pretty implausible, um, but it's a view that's out there. Um, but yeah, this is something that libertarians, if they're going to be consistent, have to grapple with, is what do you do policy-wise, moral-wise, about the fact that the actual distribution of stuff in our current society is not the result of a pristine, voluntary distribution? All right, so to sum up, the core idea of libertarianism is that it respects freedom by limiting government to the protection of free exchange and competition. Government protects you from conquest, it protects you from theft, it protects you from arbitrary assaults on your life, it enforces contracts that you make with other people, and otherwise it gets the heck out of your way. It does not do other stuff. I mean, obviously government does, but when it does it, it's not legitimate. It's a theory that primarily focuses on negative freedom. And part of the reason why th that libertarianism focuses on getting rid of all of the ways in which you can stop people from doing what they want, as opposed to just failing to give them the stuff they need to do what they want, is that negative freedom is more plausibly something you can accomplish without taking anything from everyone. If you tell me, Dr. Levine, you are not allowed to torture any of your students. Okay, you know, I won't do it. Uh, you don't take anything away from me. I mean, I, I, maybe I, maybe I, I, I love waterboarding, right? But you're not taking something that I had away from me. But if you say, Dr. Levine, um, you are responsible for making sure all of your students have enough to eat, well, suddenly you're coming into my house and you're taking my stuff and buying food for people who don't have food with it. Um, so negative freedoms what's attractive about them is that they can be respected without taking anything from everyone. And one of the practical effects that libertarians have to grapple with, either by defending it or by being concerned about it, is that as a result of this focus on process, on fair rules and letting the chips fall where they may, um, and on limited positive freedom, on limited provision, active provision of stuff for people, libertarian systems can lead to great wealth inequality. A just distribution for a libertarian might be one that is very, very unequal in a way that a lot of people find problematic, but libertarians don't. Or they find it morally unfortunate, but don't think that the solution is to take people's stuff and redistribute it. 